Oh, hi, Tom. Tom, sorry. Okay. Okay. Oh, wait, no sorry. problem. Yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> right. Hi, all right. <laughs> So How are you doing? Among, I'm fine, I'm okay, fine. Good. Among the albums that you've picked, you Bjork's. Bjork's yeah. Have you ever heard Bjork's first two albums? Uh, I, she recorded a jazz album, which I've never heard in my life, and what? an album the for four children. Cubes. Yeah, yeah. Really? She was, she, at 12, she recorded an album for children, uh, and Gling Glu, I think it's called, when she was like 16 or 8, uh, maybe during Sugar Cube's time. Yeah, never before. heard that? Uh, wow. Oh, wow. I, I, I you wish... have checked. You live in England, I'm sure you can find yeah. it. Ports, uh. <laughs> I'm very envious. I mean, at the age of 12, I wish someone had, had given me a tape recorder and asked me to make an album. I would, I would have no, nothing better in the whole world. What do you like about Bjork? Um, I think simply because I, I just think she's really inspiring. I mean, she's the, she is the only pop artist, I think, in, at, at the moment, for me, I find inspiring. Really? Yeah. I mean, her and Michael Stipe, still, uh, and R.E.M. and... Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's really it. Other than that, it's it's sort of people that aren't necessarily involved in, in white commercial rock. Yeah, you know. you, what you admire in her is her creativity. Her, yeah, her, the, the her, voice, her voice is yeah. totally unique too. Creativity and the fact that she's been doing it so long and gets better and better. And there's not many people that do that, I don't think. And she's one of them. Uh, that's, re that's it, really. She said hello to me last week. You personally know yeah. Bjork? Yeah? No, I don't. No? She said she, she, it was, we did some TV show together, and she said hello to me. And so she loves you too. No, she just said hello, and the, but she was, you know, she's being civil. She's being nice. <laughs> anyway, yes, but I wouldn't know what to say to her anyway. <laughs> I didn't and, say anything. And particularly that debut album, then. Well, particularly that because it was, I mean, it's you know. I really like Post as well, but it's it's a bit you know it's a bit um, here and there, which I think is fine. I don't mm -hmm. you know, but but as an album that I'd put on and turn up really loud in my house and and you know put up shelves, it, it would be it would be debut. Mm -hmm. Something totally different. Miles Davis, Bitches Brew. Ah uh, yeah, wow. Well, and that that was when John, did you discover Miles Davis? That was sort of about well, Johnny bought it for me two years ago, and I listened to it once and thought, no, no, don't like this. Really? You know, like you do with with certain albums, you just sort of, no, I can't cope with this. Uh, and then I listened to it again, really, really stoned in an airport, mm -hmm. and thought it was amazing. Yeah. But then, and then another sort of. I don't know, six months went by, and I've just recently started listening to it properly uh, on, on headphones, really loud. Um, and I mean, I didn't know before, but there's like, there's three drum kits going on, there's two people playing Fender Rhodes pianos, and, um, and he's sort of mixing it all up and down. Um, and, you know, if you describe that to someone, they'd say, my God, that sounds like it's going to be awful. But there's something about it that, um, I, personally at the moment, that's the most inspiring record I have. Mm -hmm. I just put that on and I'm just buzzing for, for the whole day. Have you other Miles Davis recordings? Um, or it's the no, only one you're still digesting this one? That's the only one. I've, digesting I've, this Johnny one. bought me kind of blue as well, and I didn't really like that. I kind of mm -hmm. thought, thought it was a bit... Um, uh, I think that, there's a Cecil Taylor record where he's, he sounds like he's just... This is some piano player and he just sounds like he's got the cat and the cat struck him down at the piano <laughs> and the drum is out of time and there's something about it. Have you ever I've seen documentaries on Miles Davis? Uh, I haven't, no. no because Johnny is an obsessive Miles Davis. Person. Because he had really a punk attitude towards you know, his, yeah. his art. You know, he didn't well, what give freaks it me out, I was, in, I was in a record shop in Paris and um, for some reason it was Paris that, 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 and the Miles Davis section was, was like a whole block. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they were all different. It's like, mm -hmm. hey, how did he do that? He must have had a tape record going all his life. <laughs> REM now. You've toured with REM, but I'm sure you have. You, you've picked Life Street's Pageant. Life Street's Pageant because um, when I was at school, I was really into, I was, I was a total new romantic. And I was really, a little, yeah, Japan freak. I was, okay. I was totally into Japan. <laughs> um, and uh, one of my friends, and, and I'd really gone off guitar music and rock music, and I was just not into it at all. Right. Uh, and and Life Switch Pageant, Begin the Begin, was, was the record that got me back into electric guitars, you mm -hmm. know. Which, of course, when I told Peter Buck that, he thought it was really funny. <laughs> but they can still make strong albums, you know, after, you know, been working yeah. for 10 years. I know, it's, it's frightening, amazing. really. But I mean, but I think, really, the, the, the reason they can do that is that they don't have that sort of... They don't have that fundamental belief that they're wonderful, you know. They're hypercritical of everything they do. 
and they sort of seem to have a sense of humour about what they do. I mean, I think their next record's going to be amazing, simply because of what's going on between the four of them at the moment. You know, sometimes you can just sort of feel it. Okay. Talking heads to remain in light, sir. Um, because uh, it's... Talking heads to remain in light is because I've never heard anything like it. I, I actually did hear um, on a radio station back at home at the weekend, they played one thing, one um, sort of really obscure um, Jamaican track, which sounded a bit like some of Remain in Light, because it was all sort of, you know, all the rhythms were cycling round and round and round and round. There wasn't much going on except this guy uttering rubbish. Mm -hmm. um, but it was really sort of, wow, you know. Um, I, I think Remain in Light is it's one of those albums I just put it on and I cannot work out where how he did it, how, I just can't work it out, you know. If I ever met um, David Byrne, I would just sort of pin him down and say, how did you make that record? It's impossible. I it, it, yeah. saw that little genius David Byrne, for yeah, sure. Definitely. DJ Crush. Oh, yeah. Who is um, he? He's on Moax, which is James Lavelle's um, dance label in Britain. Um, probably through Sony here, actually. Yeah. Um, uh, DJ Crush, is, uh, I, I think he's Japanese. I don't know anything about him. You I know bought, nothing about him? No. I, I bought his first album called Turntableized because I like the cover, which was done by 3D from Massive Attack. Okay. Uh, and I've just bought the new one, which is Mezo, M E I S O. Yeah. And it's just more DJ Crush. It's really, really brilliant. Uh, and he's. I mean, he's got people singing and, and rapping on it this time, and the first one was instrumental. But he's sort of, he's just basically doing drum breaks, and he's basically just using turntables and virtually nothing else. And I'd really I'd just admire it. He's just really, really good at what he does. He's, they're the best sort of drum breaks I've heard in a long time. That and that's what you discovered, essentially. DJ yeah. Crush. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for stopping at Les Cimetières de City, Thelma.